Thank you, Doug, and, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone from across Canada and, and well beyond our Canadian borders as well to our fourth webinar in our uh, National Screening Toolkit for Children and Youth Identified and Potentially Affected by Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder in, in this webinar series. Um, this series began in March of this year, and as Doug mentioned, this is our fourth webinar and we're, we're just delighted at, first of all, um, the, the numbers of, of colleagues and individuals from across the country who, are, who have attended all of our webinars. Many of you have sort of signed on to the complete series. The feedback has been very positive, and we would really encourage you to continue to stay connected with us here in the national office to really provide your feedback on how useful these webinars have been to you, perhaps what you're doing with the information, because that is going to help us continue to develop and improve um, the screening toolkit. We really have designed the kit to be a living document, and really your feedback in terms of using the various tools within the kit as well as the um, impact that it's had on your respective practices and, um, and, uh, and, and really interaction with your respective communities is really key to, uh, to us. Just very briefly in March of 2005, as, as most everyone on, online and joining us today are aware, the Public Health Agency of Canada endorse the Canadian guidelines for the diagnosis of FASD. However, as we probably are all very aware, the capacity of diagnostic clinics has continued to be low compared to the prevalence of FASD, uh, which in fact is estimated to be 9.1 per thousand live births. The validity and reliability of available screening tools had not yet, certainly in 2005, been systematically investigating, investigated rather, uh, limiting, uh, therefore, the further assessment and, uh, and diagnosis uh, capacity. In partnership with many, and I really have to emphasize many FASD experts, researchers, organizations, CAFC has been very proud and pleased to facilitate over the last several years now, the development of our National Screening Toolkit for Children and Youth. Uh, the upcoming webinar series, or, or our current series again that began in March, has introduced many to the components of the toolkit, as well as engaged um, many of our stakeholders in a very interactive dialogue. And we really encourage you to use the, uh, the question box, as Doug has highlighted, uh, to really share your thoughts and specific questions to today's presentations. Um, all of our presentations are, are up on our CAN, our Knowledge Exchange Network, as Doug mentioned. And, and again, I would encourage you, if you didn't have an opportunity to participate in the first three, to have a peek at those. Today we're going to focus on the maladaptive behavior screening tools, the neurobehavioral screening tool, as well as screening for youth probation officers. Uh, it is truly CAFC's honor to welcome our three speakers today. And, uh, and our speakers are uh, Kelly Nash, uh, Julie Conry, and, uh, and Av Chutley. And um, Av and Kelly and uh, Julie are, are with, uh, with Doug and I, at least virtually, online. Uh, Kelly is going, to, uh, is going to be our first presenter. And I believe everyone has the Neurobehavioral Screening Tool, the NST, up on, on your uh, various screens. So just briefly, a little bit about Kelly. Uh, Kelly is currently entering the last year of her PhD in School and Clinical Psychology at the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education um, at the University of Toronto. Kelly's research interests lie in understanding the neurobehavioral phenotype in children with FASD, with a particular interest in improving and developing diagnostic and intervention strategies. 
Kelly's doctoral research has focused on evaluating the behavioral as well as neuroplastic outcomes following self-regulation therapy for children with FASD. And I'm also pleased to say that Kelly is a recipient of a CIHR, Frederick Banting, and Charles Best uh, Canada Graduate Scholarship. Um, without any further ado, it is truly my pleasure to welcome you, Kelly, and to thank you for joining us on today's webinar. And I will uh, turn the, uh, the uh, virtual microphone as well as the screen uh, over to you. Welcome, Kelly. Oh, thank you, Elaine, for that wonderful introduction. And good afternoon on the East Coast and good morning on the West Coast. Um, it is my pleasure to be able to share um, en masse the, the NST with, with everyone. And I just want to quickly acknowledge my mentors and collaborators on the project, Dr. Gideon Korn and Dr. Joanne Rovette. So I'll just hop right into uh, to things here and just give you a brief overview of um, what I'm going to be going over in today's webinar. I'm going to just provide a brief rationale for why we chose um, behavior, and particularly parent-rated behavior, as our method of screening. And I'll use a case study to walk us through the different stages of screening tool development that we've been going, we've undergone at SickKids, and then use that case study to actually work through the NST. And then I'll briefly touch on some of our next steps, because as Elaine mentioned, this is a working, living document and we are looking forward to seeing it evolve, evolve and improve on it. So one of the areas that we find um, to be, or some of the areas we find to be particularly challenging for kids diagnosed with an FASD are in the areas of attention and social cognition and self-regulation. And these very cognitive abilities have a very significant impact on a child's ability to successfully navigate their social world. And these are indeed some of the areas that our caregivers and parents tell us are particularly affected. And so we can really see that in John, who we're going to get to know pretty well uh, in, our, in my presentation today. And so I'll just, if you've got, you can read along uh, with me. So John is a 12-year-old grade 6 student in a special education behavior class. John was removed from his mother's care at eight months old due to drug and alcohol abuse um, on the part of his mom. He's had several foster care placements and currently resides in a group home. John learns best when there is structure and clear rules outlined in a nonverbal format. His teachers and group home workers describe him as running on a motor and being distracted by the slightest noise. After a distraction, John has great difficulty reorienting to the task at hand. John has been diagnosed with an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, and an oppositional defiant disorder, ODD, as well as depression. John was recently arrested for stealing hockey cards and cigarettes from the corner store, an act which he denies despite video footage. His group home workers also report theft at home and describe him as disobedient. They express their frustration that despite trying several social skills interventions, John still does not show remorse and continues to be impulsive. According to one of his workers, John may be 12, but he's functioning like an 8-year-old. So, I'm sure to all of you who work in the field of FASD, that doesn't sound like new information. And indeed, one of our, our challenges as clinicians is differential diagnosis. While John, from that uh, vignette, does display difficulties in attention and social cognition and self-regulation, all aspects of the FASD profile, those are also common characteristics of other disorders of childhood. And so at the screening stage, one of the, the areas that we felt as, as a group of researchers to be especially important was finding a tool that could not only sort of pick out behavioral differences in kids with FASD compared to typically developing unexposed kids, but also children, unexposed children with other um, developmental uh, challenges. So that was sort of part one of our, our screening. And our other challenge was addressing the issue of access. So if you look at the map of Canada I've got up here, Canada is a vast country, and our diagnostic centers are predominantly in large city centers. And so if John were to reside in a remote northern Manitoba community, it would be particularly difficult for John to access the necessary diagnostic services. So one of our goals was to put together a simple behavioral screener to identify the kids most at need of a diagnostic assessment. So, 
where do we start? We use, decided to use an already validated questionnaire as our foundation, the Child Behavior Checklist. And this is a, for the clinical psychologists in the audience. This is a very common arsenal in our toolkit for probing parent-rated behavior. And, and the original CBCL was comprised of 118 items. Um, and those items probe aspects of behavior and social functioning around regulation, attention, and rule breaking, just to name a few. So with that in mind, how can we take, how did we take those CBCL items and put them into a short, simple screening form that we can try to apply to John? So it's pretty evident that John isn't functioning like a typically developing child, but my field relies on um, evidence to be able to make our diagnostic and screening, recommend, screening recommendations. And so we still need to prove that John isn't quite functioning um, as we might hope for his developmental level. And so that was where we started with our stages of screening tool development. So in 2001, we actually looked at all 118 items on the CBCL. And we looked at how kids with FASD compared to a group of typically developing children. And we found that 10 items, after several statistical analyses, which I, I won't bore you with right now, we found 10 items to be particularly discriminative of children with FASD. And those were acts young, inattentiveness, hyperactivity, cruelty, disobedience, lacking guilt, impulsivity, lying and cheating, stealing at home, and stealing outside. And I've abbreviated the items um, here. And I just, I just want to mention that those of us working in um, ch childhood disability and mental health, we all strive to, to frame disabilities in a positive manner. And in order to keep with the validity of the CBCL, we, we needed to stay true to the way the items were worded in, in that context. And so I just want to let you know that we're well aware that these might be not um, as we would hope them to be down the road, but we, we need to keep our statistical rigor as we move forward. So with those t 10 items, how did we go and put them in to make, a, make it a useful screening tool? Well, we used a statistical technique called receiver operating characteristic curves. And that gives us sensitivity and specificity rates, which is basically false positive and false negative rates. And what we were able to find is out of all those 10 items, the best false positive and false negative rates were achieved by using a cutoff of six out of seven of those items. And that gave us a 14% false positive and 18% false negative rate. And for those of you who aren't very familiar with this um, statistical technique, it's just important to mention that the gold standard um, for screening is having a sensitivity and specificity rate above 70%. So we were well within that. And one of the things that's important to keep in mind is not every child with an FASD has attention difficulties. We know um, from the mounting evidence that about 30% of, of kids on the spectrum don't display any attention disorders. And so we wanted to make sure we didn't miss those, those children um, in our screening when we were comparing them to the general population of, of kids. And so we took, pulled out um, four items, no guilt, lying and cheating, disobedience at home, and acting young, and submitted those to um, our rock analysis. And we were able to, to find with a cutoff of three out of four items a 30% false positive and 20% false negative rate. So it's pretty evident that we can start to tease John apart from typically developing kids. But I've highlighted in red some of um, John would fall into that 70% of kids who may have a suspected FASD who also have attention problems. So how can we tease John apart from a child with an ADHD? And this was our second phase of screening tool development. So in 2006, using a new sample of typically developing children, we also included an ADHD group. And what we were able to show is we replicated the same 10 items um, as differentiating typically developing kids from children with an FASD. And we also found six items that differentiated children with ADHD from children with FASD. And those were acts young, cruelty, lacking guilt after misbehaving, lying and cheating, stealing at home, and stealing outside. So when we submitted those items to our rock analysis, we were able to have a false pos positive rate of 19% and false negative rate of 28% with a cutoff of three out of six items. But our dog was not done, especially when we go back to the case of John. John clearly shows some behaviors that, are also, that also typify the um, ODD and CD profile. So in an effort to try and tease 
got the FASD from ODD profile apart even further, we went back um, to the drawing board and we used a third sample of typically developing kids, a second and brand new sample of children with ADHD, and this time we included a third group, namely children with ODD and CD. And we were pleased to see that the same 10 items we, for the third time replicated differentiated children with um, FASD from typically developing kids, the same six items differentiated kids with ADHD from children with FASD, and only one item differentiated children with FASD from children with ODD, and that's from the third box there, and that's Axiom. And I think for, for those of us who, who work with children on the FASD spectrum, while it is only one item, I think it's really particularly meaningful in, in the way with which it describes some of the challenges and difficulties that are, that are faced by um, by these children and, and young adults and adolescents in the sense that these behavior, this behavioral profile, which can be quite disruptive, is not necessarily coming from a, a place of, of malice, but rather um, an underdeveloped um, brain. So we were, because there was only one item that differentiated children with FASD from ODD, we were not able to submit it to, to Brock analysis, but you'll see how it comes into play with the, the tool shortly. So you can probably, I hope I've set it up well enough for you to see that we're point, we proposed a three-step tool for identifying potential FASD, and I want to stress the word potential, with the first step to identify behavior that's suggestive of an FASD if you were to just to take FASD compared to a group of typically developing children, and that was the first bit that I, that I presented. With the second step of the tool being to differentiate the FASD profile from the ADHD profile, which was the second part that I presented, and finally, to differentiate the FASD profile from the ODD profile. And before I get into the tool, this is very important, who should use the NST? Um, so this is sort of extrapolated from the form as it appears on CAPC's website. Um, the NST is designed to be administered with caregivers of children and youth suspected of having an FASD. So this would be based on parents' behavioral observations and prenatal exposure history. And Importantly, um, the form should be administered to the caregiver by a qualified health and social service professional, which is a social worker, law enforcement personnel, psychologist, or child and youth worker, and this is the important piece, in the context of a clinical interview. So we want you to be using this if you've got expertise providing a clinical interview. Um, we feel the items, while we've got them you know, neatly laid out for ease of use, would be best used when embedded within a larger context. Um, with the idea that you go back afterwards and look at, use your clinical notes to answer the questions. Um, the form should not be given to the caregiver or scored by the caregiver, and it's important to explain that the aim is to gain a picture of the child's behavior within the last six months, and this is the, the guidelines on the CBCL. And with that all in mind, we want this to be quick and simple. It is screening. It is the first step in, in addressing the needs of, of a ch child with FASD. And so we're hoping it should take you about five minutes to fill out the score. So we're going back to John. Um, it's clear John's got, got a lot of challenges, and we're going to see how we can apply the screening tool to John to try and get him some help. So this is, ex again, extrapolated from what's on the, the CAPC website. So we're hoping you've got John in your working memory. Um, and so you, after your interview, the idea is that you go back to this form um, and you, you Go back to your information, and do we have information that John is thought to act too young for his or her age? Well, John's worker reported that he is 12, but he functions like an 8-year-old. So we would tick yes. Um, has he been reported to be disobedient? Yeah, unfortunately, he's not doing so well in the group home. And he indeed has been accused of lying, as he, there's video evidence of him stealing, but he, he didn't admit to it. Um, does he lack guilt? Indeed, his, his workers report that he doesn't seem to, to lack remorse. And questions 5, 6, and 7 get at items of attention and hyperactivity. And from the vignette, it's pretty evident that, that John struggles with all three, so we can give him a yes for all three. Do, do his workers and caregivers describe him as cruel or being a bully or mean to others? And in fact, they don't. Um, has he been accused of stealing from the group home? He has, and we know there's evidence that he stole from the corner store. So on this same page on the NSD is a box at the bottom that you'll see when you go to use it. And so I'm going to take you back up to question uh, number one in the first row. And so if you had ticked yes, 
you would place a check mark in all of the co all of columns A, B, C, and D. And so I've put the I've ordered it numerically instead of ticks just to highlight for, for ease of understanding the number one to show a tick in each of those boxes. And then when we move to question two, you see if you endorsed a yes, you would place a check in column A, so there's a two in column A and column C, and so on. So once you've got all your ticks uh, in line, you would move on to page two of the NST, um, and I'll walk you through it. So follow the boxes. This is supposed to be simple. Um, are there at least six checks in column A for John? So we go back and we can see, yep, yeah, there's at least six checks, so we can move, we'll follow the yes. Are there at least three checks in column B? There were th more than three checks in column B, so we'll keep going. Was there one check in column D? There was, and that one check represents that, that item that we feel is particularly critical that was able to differentiate across all three groups, acts young. So was there that one item? Yep. So in John's case, he would screen positive for an FASD. Now, as I mentioned, um, no, John has the characteristic attention profile of some of some of the children on the FASD spectrum. But if he didn't, he wouldn't have met the criteria for six checks in column A. So we would answer no. So what would happen in that case? There would be a second opportunity to screen for John as, as follows. So he would need four ticks in B and one in D, and he would screen positive. If not, he would screen negative. And so this is essentially what the second page of the NST looks like. So I hope that wasn't too complicated and it was as easy as to follow as, as we hoped. And at, at the end, if there's anyone has any feedback about the ease of use of this, that would be fantastic. Um, and importantly, and I know that our previous uh, speakers have, have stressed this as well as Elaine, screening is not meant to be a diagnosis. This is a simple behavior tool that really only probes one aspect of a child. And we, the diagnostic process for an FASD is uh, multimodal using multiple professionals and multiple areas of, of assessment. And so importantly, screening is meant to be a public health service in which members of a defined population who do not necessarily perceive they are at risk of or already affected by a disease or its complications are asked a question or offered a test to identify those individuals who are more likely to be helped than harmed by further tests or treatment to reduce the risks of a disease or its complications. And I think that really exemplifies what the entire toolkit is, is attempting to do. So in terms of our next step, um, it's very important to prospectively evaluate this tool, um, to go in before kids have been diagnosed and see if we get similar um, false positive and false negative rates um, prior to sort of retrospectively looking back at the CBCL. And the this is currently underway at clinics in Edmonton and Toronto, um, as well as in the elementary uh, and, uh, high schools in, in Winnipeg, and, and perhaps Dr. Chudley will, will want to speak to this at the end. Um, and one of the major gaps in, in the toolkit in general is that other than the meconium screening, we don't have a lot available for our preschoolers. Um, and this is especially important um, with respect to the, the current tool because if we're trying to use screening as a method for early identification, leading to earlier intervention, we're really missing an important group of kids. While the CBCL does have a version available for kids one and a half to five, it's going to be very dif difficult for us to apply our current methodology to this population um, because most children that young are not diagnosed with an ADHD or an ODD. And so we're sort of currently in the, the think tank phase as to how we can come up with an appropriate clinical comparison group for this young age range so we can apply this as the CBCL for, for our younger kids. And just before I wrap it up and hand it back over to Doug for any questions that you may have, I just want to thank some folks who've been um, on board along the way. Dr. Paul Sandor at uh, UFail Treatment Center in Toronto, who um, collaborated to allow us to include an, an ODD group, and, and Dr. Judy Wiener, um, who is one of my mentors at OISE. And a thank you to the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario for a graduate studentship that funded um, my research. So back to you, Doug. Well, that was a great way to start off this webinar. 
And this also gives me an opportunity to uh, invite any comments from our other panelists if they have anything they want to uh, add to this. But while they're thinking of any comments, uh, it also gives me an opportunity to remind the audience that uh, this, there is opportunities to ask questions. Uh, I, as we mentioned at the top of the webinar, for those of you who may have joined after the explanations, uh, there's a question box in your, uh, probably the panel that's probably on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, you can just type in your questions there, and it's during these changeovers between presenters where we're more than happy to take questions for the speaker as well as the panel to, to discuss and debate. Uh, we haven't had any questions as of yet, but uh, if you do have any questions related to what Kelly's just presented, feel free to ask them, and we will get to questions at the end. And often we have too many questions. I didn't mention this at the top of the presentation, but uh, we often have too many questions to answer fully in the hour and a half that we have scheduled. So we often can extend the presentation a bit. As I mentioned, we do record these, so if most people do have to leave after the uh, scheduled hour and a half, but we do record them. So uh, for those of you who do leave, we, you can come back to the um, to the recording that will be on the Knowledge Exchange Network, and we'll put those links on how to get to that uh, back up. So, were there any comments uh, from the other, any of the other panelists, uh, Ab or Julie? Well, one of the things that I was just going to mention is that um, as I'm going through the probation officer screening tool, there is a slide at the very end that talks about, you know, how you need to look at uh, the specific group that you're screening and what brings them into that screening group. Uh, because I think that what Kelly's talking about actually could be combined with what I am talking about for the probation situation and have even um, a broader application. So maybe just keeping that in mind, and then I'll, I'll be coming back to that at the end myself. That's great. Thanks, Julie. All right, well, we did get a few questions came in. Um, Nicole's asking, is the tool presently available? And yes, it is available on the Knowledge Exchange Network. And we did have that uh, that uh, URL at the, on the screen earlier in the presentation, and I'll bring it back up at the very end. Um, and that link is is www.ken.cafc.org. That's K-E-N.C-A-P-H-C.org. And all of there's a category on on FASD screening tools on there. You can also use the search bar or the tag cloud that's on the front page, and and you should be able to find all of the information there. There are pages in the FASD section related to all of our webinars uh, that we've done on our FASD series, as well as uh, links to the toolkit itself on the page, as well as some of the the proceedings from some of the uh, workshops and stuff that led to the development of the screening toolkit. Uh, Nancy's asked uh, Kelly, uh, how did you determine if the ADHD group were diagnosed accurately? Well, our ADHD group um, came from predominantly from the clinic at Sick Kids Hospital, which uses a, a team of diagnosticians, namely clinical psychologists and psychiatrists, um, and so their CBCLs would have been filled out at the time of diagnosis, um, and so they were diagnosed according to DSM-4 criteria, and we extrapolated the information from the CBCL at the moment in time with which they were diagnosed. Um, we were also able to obtain whether or not there was a prenatal alcohol exposure history. Again, as is, as plagues research in this field by parent report, um, but we did have all of that, that documented and that is something that um, is sort of status quo and protocol at the, the clinics at Sick Kids. All right, thanks. Um, as Sheila has asked, uh, she has a couple questions here. Is there value in using an autism screen for one to five years? Uh, use the, the case study that you used indicates a sensory issue. Mm, that's a fantastic question. Um, and actually, there's a kind of emerging literature to, that, starts to, that has started to look at the FASD profile compared to an ASD profile because both diagnoses share um, a sensory component and that might be uh, a very interesting and, and creative way to capture those younger kids. And she also asked, do parents need to give approval to have this tool used on their child? Well, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that they, they essentially um, under the, in the context of a, of a clinical interview are, you know, giving their, their blessing for that information to be used um, under the guise of, of the professional tools that are used in those settings. Um, I think where the issue gets sort of sticky is the, this, the idea of querying around a prenatal alcohol exposure history, um, which is something that, you know, we do sensitively um, over the course of our practice, and so I think um, if that was the, a referring issue, as sort of Julie was getting back to knowing the population that you're, you're screening with, it would be taken care of within that, 
Um, I'm not sure if Julie or, or, or Ab have anything to add. I think it is a, a bit of a sticky question, um, and maybe it is something that you know there should be some group discussion about because, um, in a sense, what could happen is that the, the parent is participating in an evaluation, and I'm guessing that is not for FASD. They have not come to the evaluation for FASD, but at the end of the clinical interview, the clinician may very well be saying, uh, well, I was asking some questions that might point to FASD or, or you know, somehow or another. I, I think we have to uh, talk about how that should be done mm -hmm. at some point. And the same thing applies. Of... No, go ahead, Julie. Well, I was just going to say, and the same thing applies to the probation officer screening tool as well. Um, and so what we need to do in our setting is that if the probation officers are going to be screening the individuals for our program, they have to get consent from the caregiver, uh, well, or the legal guardian in order to do that. So in our case, they know that they're being screened for a possible FASD assessment. But it's a little bit yeah. different. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a really good point, and I think one of the, the sort of best practices in, in psychology anyways is to get a, a thorough developmental history um, from your interviewee, whether it be a, a biological parent or adoptive parent. And so I think if there were queries around prenatal alcohol abuse, abuse from that interview, it would then be important to be very clear with um, the caregiver that you might have, you know, depending on the rest of the interview, you might have some questions around uh, um, an FASD and, and to get their consent to proceed in that way. All right, thanks for that, uh, that great discussion. Uh, we do have one more question uh, for you, Kelly, and uh, during the, while you're answering this question, we'll hand uh, the, the screen over to Julie so she can get ready to do her presentation. But uh, this is actually from Virginia. It's a, a sort of a comment and a question. Um, and it says, uh, she says, she's delighted to hear our, your strong recommendation that the tool be used in the context of a clinical interview and also that it does not provide a diagnosis. She wonders, given the face value of the instrument, which indicates strongly antisocial behaviors, i.e. no remorse, if training will be provided to help clinicians explain the relationship of impulsivity and developmental delays, i.e. acts younger, to misbehaviors. I am not sure that I, I'm, I can personally answer that. I mean, I, I'm sure, and, and I'm not sure if someone else can maybe speak to this, that our, as this toolkit grows, um, we'll be able to add um, those types of components to it. So once you screen positive for an FASD, then what um, types of questions? But um, I'm not sure. Maybe I can throw that over to either Elaine or Julie or Ab. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's Elaine, and, and thank you, Kelly. I, I think it's an excellent question, and it really speaks to the kind of feedback that we're really, um, we, we have received and hoping to continue to receive from, from those participating. Um, I think the answer, in a nutshell, is this could be something, um, and I'll look to Ab as one of our fellow steering committee members, this is something that we can address and should address in the next part of our work with the screening toolkit and perhaps be able to provide some additional how-to um, information and guidelines, if you will, to the kit that could in fact address the question that uh, Virginia has posed. So I think, um, I'm not, I don't believe we've mentioned this thus far, all of these questions and, and the um, electronic feedback that we receive on the webinars are being archived, and uh, and this is information that we can go back to uh, to help us continue to build on this work. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, it's a real. I think it's important we meant that Kelly has emphasized that this is a screen and not a diagnosis. Um, and then, what do you do when you got to pause the screen? And you're in an area where there's no diagnostic services. Uh, but I think um, so that that's a that's a real tough tough issue. But I think there has to be advocacy, and uh, eventually, uh, I think the capacity is going to be increased uh, outside of the major centers for diagnosis. Yeah. Because um, 
Yeah, I think there's a danger because we saw the false positive rates. You know, you, there are a lot of kids that are, may not be affected by alcohol, and certainly how do you pose this with a family who's got a positive screen and, and there's been no alcohol exposure? Or who asks about the alcohol exposure? So th these are real difficult questions. Um, yeah. Kelly mentioned about the fact we're trialing this in schools in Manitoba. Um, this, uh, this is, um, we're using some of the, these questions we hope to embed within the EDI. This is an early developmental index that's questionnaire for teachers given near the end of the year of kids in kindergarten. And they'll, this was being done every, every two years. And we wanted to use this screen anonymously to try to look at what proportion of kids actually would screen positive for the screen. And, and I, I guess that's one way of trying to establish what the possible prevalence is in the school age population. Uh, we're not using a diagnostic tool, we're using the screen tool. So there's going to be some problems with interpretation of those results and also the fact that this is a teacher that's answering the questions and, and not a caregiver. So it's, it's just a, a trial as part of the research we're doing to see how valuable this t tool might be in extending the work that uh, Kelly and her group has started. All right, thanks, thanks, Ab, for the, for, and, and the whole panel for that great discussion. We did get a couple more questions, and as I mentioned, we will come back to those at the end. They, they will definitely get answered, but uh, we should move on with the presentation so we can make sure that we get uh, at least all the presenters in in our scheduled time. So I'm just going to hand it over to Elaine to provide a, an introduction of our next presenter. Okay, thanks, Doug, and, and, and my thanks as well for that uh, wonderful presentation, Kelly, and for the subsequent discussion to all. Um, our next two presenters, and, and it really is my pleasure uh, together to introduce uh, Dr. Julie Conry as well as Dr. Uh, Ab Chutley. Uh, Julie received her Ph.D. Uh, in 1969 uh, from the University of Wisconsin and retired from the University of British Columbia in 2001 after 33 years in the Department of Educational and Counseling Psychology as well as special ed. Uh, Julie currently provides the um, psychological assessments as part of the multidisciplinary team evaluations for FASD at the Asante Center for Fetal Alcohol Syndrome in British Columbia and um, with doctors Diane Fast as well as Christine Locke who has been one of our presenters in this series uh, Julie collaborated on the first Canadian prevalence study of youth with FASD in the criminal justice system. And with Dr. Fast, co-authored the book, Fetal Alcohol Syndrome and Criminal Justice System in 2000. And perhaps that's a reference that we can put up on the Knowledge Exchange Network as well. Julie is a former member of the Public Health Agency of Canada's National Advisory Committee on FASD and has co-authored Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Canadian Guidelines, and that was what we, uh, we had talked about in my opening remarks, and of course those guidelines uh, being published back in 2005. Um, Julie will, will kick off this part of the uh, presentation, which will focus on screening for youth probation officers, and then uh, we will welcome um, Dr. Ab Chudley, and uh, Ab will then um, focus on um, the research emerging on how the tool can be potentially introduced and evaluated at the Manitoba FASD Youth Justice Program at the Manitoba Youth Center. And just very briefly about uh, Dr. Chudley, Ab is currently the medical director of the genetics and metabolism program at the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority and is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at the department uh, and the Department of Biochemistry and Medical Genetics, University of Manitoba. Ab has been a consultant on issues related to FASD provincially, nationally, and internationally. And he is a former member as well of the public Health Agency of Canada's National Advisory Committee. Um, AB co-authored again with Julie and others our Canadian FASD Diagnostic Guidelines. Um, it is my pleasure 
to welcome um, Ab to our webinar today and also to recognize and thank Ab for his leadership on CAPC's national FASD screening tool development initiative. So firstly, everyone should be viewing Julie's slides uh, in front of your screen. And Julie, a big thank you to you. And um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. And thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here and welcome everyone who's uh, attending the webinar. Uh, and so I'm going to now speak on our Youth Probation Officers screening tool. And you can see the, the title there. Uh, and just to give you uh, the background, I will be talking about its, its development. Uh, but it has come about uh, because at the Asante Center, where we do assessments for FASD, uh, we've received funding to um, do assessments on youth who are referred by their probation officers. Um, so this is why it was developed. And it turns out that by combining a simple checklist of social or environmental factors plus the personal use factors, for our group it has been effective in identifying the children youth who are likely to receive an FASD diagnosis when assessed. And I'll just point out, uh, I've used the word social slash environmental because in our earlier uh, publications and work, we called it environmental factors, but now we're starting calling them social factors, so um, those are one and the same. So I'll talk about the development, its use, and of course the need for further research to ensure its validity. So in addition to the Knowledge Exchange Network, you can download the tool and the guidebook at the Asante Center website. You can see it there, asantecenter.org. Uh, so, first of all, the importance of screening in this population. And so I think probably for many people in our audience, uh, there is this awareness that individuals with FASD are disproportionately represented in the youth criminal justice system, as well as in the adult criminal justice system. And so it's thought that these underlying neurobehavioral problems, which are caused by prenatal alcohol exposure, increase the susceptibility to trouble with the law. And uh, what we know, you know, is not all children with FASD, of course, get into trouble with the law, but there's something about that brain damage that increases the susceptibility. Uh, and we do this uh, particularly for this group because we believe that by making the diagnosis and for uh, those family members, um, their communities, and so on, by having that diagnosis that we can improve outcomes for those affected. But as Kelly also pointed out, we're certainly unable to assess everybody with a full FASD diagnostic assessment, so we need to do some kind of screening to bring in those youth who are most likely to receive that diagnosis. So the next screen just shows um, a picture of the, the manual itself and how it looks on the website. Um, there's a description of the background and how it should be used. Um, I'm not going to be talking about every page of this. Uh, of the screening tool because it's a screening and referral tool because the idea is that once youth are screened, they should be referred for assessment. So the tool itself incorporates on the first page, uh, which may be a little small for you to read, but you'll be able to see it on the website, of course, just background information and for us, very critical, that list of previous assessments because we often find youth have had other assessments, whether it's through a forensic uh, organization, through schools, mental health assessments, and those are extremely valuable. And, um, and you'll notice that right up at the top, what I referred to before, that we've received the guardian consent to go ahead with the screening. Uh, the second page is a screening tool, but I'll be spending more time on that, the main part of my discussion here. Um, the next page we call case management, and it's uh, just information to help sort of guide those caregivers, probation officers. It talks about is the youth in custody, does he have a court date, what kind of offenses he's committed, has he received alcohol and drug treatment, is he attending school. So just basic information around case management. And then the last page you'll see there is a behavioral checklist. And I'll be spending a little bit more time on that. In and of itself, it's not a part of making a diagnosis, but once you have a number of those behaviors, it certainly is important information to try to figure out how to better manage the youth. So it's just a way of accumulating the information. Uh, and again, um, the, the ideas of screening and diagnosis uh, should be well known to you from the other sessions that you have probably attended. 
Uh, but again, to really emphasize the importance of the screening leads to a diagnostic assessment. And that screening cannot be used as a substitute for the assessment. And I think everybody understands that, but I still will hear people saying, well, this individual is not going to get a diagnosis or have the opportunity for a diagnostic assessment, so we'll just use the screening. But that can be dangerous. And, um, and I think particularly when we're talking about FASD, we have to really think about the sensitivity of the diagnosis and the effect of that diagnosis on the youth and also on the family, particularly uh, the biological family. And so again, you're now familiar with the concepts of specificity and sensitivity and how those two have to be combined in order to, to um, develop an effective tool. And so we believe there shouldn't be follow-up if you can't do the diet, or you shouldn't do the screening if you can't follow up. Um, to make a diagnosis or assume a diagnosis that would turn out to be incorrect, we feel can be harmful. And we certainly have had a lot of experience with individuals who, on the basis of probably informal screening that people have done, probably on the basis of the maternal history, but have been told all their lives they have FASD, but then they later turned out to have perhaps a different syndrome, or when uh, an assessment was done, the data did not warrant a diagnosis. So I, we have to be very careful with how we use the screening. Additionally, um, a screening tool should not take a lot of time. So this particular screening tool, our, our POs tell us, um, should not take more than, or, or it does not take more than about 10 minutes. And we want to have items that uh, are not difficult for the rater to answer. It, they should be items that the rater, in this case the probation officer, he has this information available to him because he knows the youth or it's easily accessible. And the tools should not require the rater to take a lot of additional training to understand the underlying concepts of what we're trying to measure. So when you look at the, the screening tool, the items themselves seem very simple and very straightforward. But they're rated in the context of an understanding of FASD. And so we believe that the probation officers should not be using the screening tool nor should other people, really, without an understanding of FASD. So most recently, we did a survey of probation officers' training, and we have found out that uh, across Canada, most probation officers have either received training about disabilities and FASD in their initial training, or they have access to that continuing education. So we're very pleased to see that um, that's currently true. And then our approach for the screening is to have information on the screening tool that is actually linked to specific criteria that are used for making an FASD diagnosis. And so as Kelly pointed out, in her tool, the behavioral characteristics that she's assessing, that's one aspect of an FASD diagnosis. And so what we're trying to do as well is to link our questions with the diagnostic criteria. So briefly then, um, some of the studies that have been done on FASD in the criminal justice system. There are, are two basic approaches. The first approach is to ascertain the prevalence of trouble with the law among those who have FASD. In other words, how many people with FASD get into trouble with the law? And so our best information on that comes from Ant Dreisguth, who found approximately 60%. The other approach is to to ask the question and ascertain the prevalence or incidence of FASD among those who are in trouble with the law. So how many individuals who are in corrections or in correction systems have FASD? So uh, two studies to mention are the one that I was involved with, with Dr. Fast and Dr. Locke, and this was in uh, a youth um, center, and Dr. Chudley's study, which was in an adult center, and you can see that both of ours were finding rates uh, in the 20 to, um, 20 to 30 percent range. Other people have talked about much higher rates, but we haven't really established that. But you also have to be aware that in both 1996 and our study in 1997, we were using criteria for diagnosis uh, and terminology of that day. And so that's changed. And so briefly then, in our study, you can see using the older terminology, uh, youth remanded to youth court services for assessment, 
over a one-year period. Um, three at FAS, 64 had what we call then FAE, but we'll, which would now be the group partial FAS and ARND. So this is where the 23.3% occurred over a one-year period where everybody um, was assessed. But only three of those 67 had a prior FASD diagnosis, and they weren't the full FAS. I think one was full FAS. So what that was saying at that time was that the vast majority of people who have uh, FASD were not being identified. And so following the recommendations from that study, um, what I'm reporting now are the data from 2003 to 2007 um, where we've summarized our findings using the screening tool. So uh, the Asante Center, along with uh, PLEA Community Services, were given money for this project, which, which is an ongoing program now. We continue to do this. With the purpose being to increase awareness of FASD among professionals, to screen and assess those youth, uh, to document their areas of strength and disability, and to do some case planning and family support. And so uh, briefly then, uh, even though the Canadian guidelines come out in 2005, um, we were certainly part of this process um, going back two years. And so essentially the diagnosis was used uh, with these guidelines, although the guidelines had not yet been published. And of course, these are familiar, um, the, the basic criteria for FAS, the exposure to alcohol, growth, space, central nervous system dysfunction. And I'm just uh, alerting you to that because when we talk about well, the youth that were screened in, we want to look again at how many would have been diagnosed with full FAS because of the obvious physical features of the full diagnosis. So looking at brain dysfunction, uh, what we are doing in making our assessment to make the diagnosis, we're trying to identify and look for substantial deficiencies or discrepancies across multiple areas of brain performance likely due to underlying brain structure or function rather than to adverse postnatal environmental experiences. So it's the, the brain damage of alcohol exposure that we're hoping to identify. And then um, what the psychologists, speech and language pathologists, OTs uh, on the team are doing based on the various measures. Uh, we rate each outcome unable to judge, maybe the child is too young to assess, broadly normal, mildly to moderately abnormal, or significantly abnormal. So we're looking for these key areas where there is a very significant abnormality compared to the general population. And so for the, the brain domains, that the, um, the functional brain domains, again, probably these are familiar to you. We're assessing cognitive ability, school achievement, executive functioning and or abstract reasoning, memory, communication, adaptive behavior or social skills, attention and activity level, and neurologic soft signs, which uh, primarily involve motor skills and sensory abnormality. And so for our study with the, the youth uh, referred by probation officers, they're 12 to 18 years of age, the youth justice age, and their families. Uh, they are involved in the criminal justice system. And for our, our group, um, they're residing in the Vancouver Coastal Authority or Fraser uh, Valley region, which is uh, east of uh, Vancouver, which is where the Asante Center is located. And so I'm reporting on 43 youth who are referred using the tool, and I'm going to come back again to the tool, but using the tool, 43 received a complete FASD assessment, and you can see the breakdown. And I always like to sort of make a special note of the ethnicity, because there's always been the question around, are Aboriginal youth disproportionately represented in the justice system? And the number is high here, but it's primarily because one of our most diligent probation officers, his portfolio are First Nations youth, and he also has a very particular interest in FASD. So he would tend to refer a lot of the youth. So it isn't that overall they may be represented in those proportions, but it was the diligence of this PO. So of those 43 youth, 37, which is 86%, received an alcohol-related diagnosis, FASD. But all 37 were diagnosed with alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder. None of them had full FAS. None of them had partial FAS. So essentially, we're identifying youth where 
we have that significant alcohol exposure and brain dysfunction. And so here's a list of the behaviors as reported by the youth probation officer. And again, this is not part of making the diagnosis, but you can see the, the extent of the behavioral problems. And, and um, I guess the big one here is makes poor decisions 100%. Um, but you can see high rates. Misuse of alcohol and drugs is, is huge among our group. But all of these problems are very high. And here we have the impulsivity and then easily manipulated by others and so on. So uh, a whole lot of these areas, some of them overlap with some of the things that Kelly spoke about, certainly the ADHD behaviors, uh, but some of the social deficits, no understanding of personal boundaries, and so on, thinks literally. So anyway, um, we were able to compile this list of behaviors, which corresponds to some of the things on the last page of the tool. And we're wondering whether, again, some of these behaviors could actually be incorporated into the screening itself. But at present, we don't include those. We also had observed in that group 94.6% had previously been evaluated by a mental health professional, with the average age being 8.3 years, starting at two years of age. And this is much younger as an average than in the general population of children, where the first evaluation is more around 11 years. So they're being referred and evaluated much younger. Of course, we have that, that one or two really young children there. We have those substance abuse disorders, emotional instability, uh, symptoms of hyperactivity and distractibility. Now, early signs of problems. And, and um, this is something that we found really quite um, astounding. And this is retrospective. So the validity, of course, you know, I guess would need to be checked. But already, as preschool children, you can see, particularly on the right-hand side of the graph here, uh, a large number of these youths were showing problems with attention, emotional stability, social skills difficulties as preschoolers, already some concerns about memory, already concerns about language as the key uh, behaviors. Now, keeping those in mind, this is going to come up again when we look at the tool itself. So for the 37 youth, who were diagnosed, this is the breakdown of the brain domains in terms of the ratings of normal, mild to moderate impairment, or significant impairment. To make the diagnosis, you have to have at least three domains with significant dysfunction. Uh, and in this group, the average number of domains was over five. So uh, you can see, just as you go down the list, well, there are all of these areas are represented except brain structure, hard neurological, soft neurological signs tend not to show up, but you can see that all of the rest do. And so this is a composite diagnosis using the four-digit diagnostic code, which probably you were um, shown in one of the earlier uh, webinars. And so you can see then, thinking about the diagnosis of full FAS, that none of our youth, uh, or 30 of the youth, showed no growth problems. Five showed mild, one moderate, one severe. So in general, these children are not small. The facial features, 25 showed none, and 12 showed mild. And again, nothing that stood out. But of course, it is the brain. Um, the two at the top, definite brain dysfunction, uh, according to the four-digit code, would be those individuals with probably um, a small head circumference or histories of possibly seizures or clear organic brain damage. But from the perspective of what we typically do, um, the 37 had significantly abnormal brain dysfunction, of course, in order to get the A or indeed diagnosis. And when you have a, a brain rank 3, you could have a brain rank 4 as well. So that's why it turns out at 39. And then the alcohol history, some risk or high risk. So after we had used the tool for the first year, um, we were realizing, of course, that the probation officers were not completing the screening for all of the youth on their caseloads. So who were they referring? Who did they decide to complete the form on? And did they have other additional information um, that they were actually using in some way to decide who to complete the form on and who to refer? And were these, were these other factors contributing to the high specificity that resulted from the screening tool? So would there be a way to at least get that same screening information on all of the youth? So we're able to, to do that. And at this point, we're saying risk factors for FASD because we were not, of course, able to do FASD assessments on all of the people on their caseloads. So 
what we're really saying then is, what is the prevalence of youth on probation who may have FASD as determined by the screening tool to identify factors not included on the screening tool that could indicate youth has FASD, but also to increase the awareness by, by doing the survey. So very quickly, uh, on this particular day, there were 777 youth on uh, adjudicated orders. Uh, we got information on 506, 22 already had a diagnosis, some of them from our center. So a little bit of data then on that 484 on how it, how it worked. So here's the breakdown again, a, a broader representative. Um, the data changed a little bit from our 37. And so we were including in the survey tool, so this is not the screening tool, this is the survey tool, the youth demographic data, just what probation officers knew. How well did they know the youth? How well did they think, how much knowledge did they have about FASD? How confident were they that, they that the youth might actually have FASD? What was the value of the diagnosis or the, the assessment and were there barriers? So we were collecting additional information. And then the screening items, social factors, personal use factors. These are the social factors. Youth is adopted. Youth has been in foster care or involved with child protection. A sibling may already have a diagnosis. And there is documentation that the youth is suspected of having FASD. And youth mother has a history of alcoholism or known prenatal alcohol use. So at the screening level, we're not saying that documentation during the pregnancy needs to be there. So it's just a history of alcoholism, but if it's known it was during this, the pregnancy with this youth, that's all the better. The personal factor is developmental delay. So this is where, going back to that previous chart, um, perhaps they required speech and language therapy or they required child developmental services. So that developmental delay in early childhood. School learning difficulties, you can see it's very broad, but that could be failing a grade, it could be requiring learning assistance. Is the child um, perceived to show growth deficiency? Is there a previous diagnosis of ADHD? Because that is so common among people with FASD. And then possible other mental health diagnoses. Now, mental health diagnoses are not part of making an FASD diagnosis, but there are some individuals now who suggest that maybe we should be considering it because what we know from Joanne Weinberg's research and others is that, um, that the brain changes that occur as a result of prenatal alcohol exposure may actually uh, increase the possibility of having some of these mental health disorders. And so based on combinations of the social factors and personal factors, we would put the youth into one of the following categories. Previous FASD diagnosis. And so to be at risk for FASD, and this is essentially, this is the screening tool and how it's used. Two personal factors and one social factor, or three personal factors and zero social factors. Or in the case of the survey, youth was not at risk for FASD because of none of the above. So it was very interesting when we were developing the screening tool in the middle, and we were working with a number of people who, are, who spend a lot of time in the youth justice system. And we looked at all of the items that we were selecting. And, and uh, a few people were saying, yes, but that would apply to all of the youth. But in actual fact, it doesn't. It doesn't apply to all of the youth. And here, you look at the youth probation officer's load, and it did not apply to 69%. It did apply to 26%. And when I saw that 26%, I thought, my goodness, we were talking about the 23% that we found in the, the previous study and ABS data. So this is where we're beginning to think, well, I wonder if we're really honing in now on the right group and the right uh, prevalence rate. And then finally, we have the 22 that actually had had a previous diagnosis. So recalling that we asked the probation officers, how confident are you that the youth has FASD? It appeared that they weren't even using the screening information because without the use of the screening items, based on what they thought, 60% of those with appropriate risk factors would have been missed. So what that tells us is that we have to do this in a systematic way. We can't just use kind of a, a general uh, feeling that probably this youth has FASD because of certain behaviors or their background or whatever. You have to do it in a systematic and objective way. So now, very briefly then, this is comparing then that at-risk group 
who met the screening criteria with that much larger group that did not. And you can see that there's some, some really key differences, particularly child protection services. And you can see where the differences are statistically significant. So child protection services, a big difference. Certainly the maternal history of alcohol use, a big difference there. And when you have a combination of the two, that also increases um, the risk. Sibling with FASD did not seem to be particularly helpful. I think in our day-to-day -day work, we often find out that there's a sibling with FASD, but we don't know that at the outset. That's something that, that we discover later on. And then with the personal factors, uh, you can see the comparisons again. Learning problems, a huge difference. Actually, growth, if it exists, it's a huge difference. And then that mental health difference is very large, which uh, in this uh, grouping doesn't include the ADHD, that's its own separate category. So we have mental health, but ADHD is two separate categories. So we think we're on the right track with these. And once you again do combinations of things, which in fact is what we're doing with the screening tool, you can see that there are very large differences between one particular group of individuals. We don't know for sure that they have FASD, but they're definitely a complex group of children that differ in substantial ways from a not at risk group who would not would who would not have been screened in. And so in addition, the probation officers were uh, invited to suggest factors that they thought for a particular youth would indicate that he may very well have FASD, that's different from the screening tools. And you can see what some of them are. Difficulty with comprehension, um, easily frustrated, difficulty learning from previous mistakes, uh, something was called erratic behavior, otherwise not specified difficulty following rules, and so on. So in reality, many of these could be found among youth with FASD. But here's the other group, uh, factors that suggest that he probably didn't have FASD. He's high functioning, he can keep a job, he can live independently, he's insightful. Some of them don't necessarily apply coordinated athletic. Certainly a lot of people with FASD are athletic. But you can see that the way they describe this other group is very different. But this is the concerning part. They would say, for example, I don't think the youth has FASD because no physical features. Or conduct disorder and ADHD is the problem, not FASD. And that they don't have impulsivity. Or that they may have another syndrome. And the most important one, I think, at the bottom was that they had had previous assessments and no one had ever made the diagnosis before. So that's really kind of a risky uh, factor, isn't it? Because just because no one ever said it before it doesn't mean that, uh, that it doesn't exist. So based on the research and our experience, we believe that these broad-based indicators are effective and they reflect significant deficits in underlying brain domains. And if you can confirm prenatal alcohol exposure after the screening but prior to doing the assessment, there is a high likelihood that he will receive a diagnosis as a result. And so this is how it all maps together. So you can see that in uh, the, the uh, purple uh, circles, these are the screening indicators. These are the brain domains that we assess. And you can see how they map one onto the other. A child who has learning difficulties quite likely is going to have underlying academic problems, cognitive, communication, reasoning, and memory problems. These are part of our brain domains. Developmental delay, if they have that history, probably reflects cognition, communication difficulties. And trouble with the law, the fact that they're in that group at all, it's probably problems with adaptive behavior as well as conduct disorder and impulsivity. So can this screening tool be used in other settings? Well, there's one more item on the screening tool. And it's the most important one. It's not even on the checklist. And it's whatever those underlying maladaptive behaviors are, that led him into trouble with the law, that increases the likelihood that he does have FASD. But in our group, they all have this factor, so we don't need to ask about it. And so some people have suggested, well, we could just take the tool as it is and just change a few words here and there. But you can't do that because you're missing that key item. It's, it's that variable that gets them into the program. So in other settings, you may need a different entry key to get you in. It's kind of getting you past the first screen. And this is where I was excited about Kelly's uh, discussion, because I'm thinking that 
we may be able to use those behavioral indices as the entry tool into another setting, perhaps schools or, or other settings, where then we could use some of these broader based indices. So I'm looking forward to the idea of actually looking at combinations of some of our screening tools. And then finally, on this slide, what this shows is that one of the things that happened over the course of our years with our program is that early on, we had a stronger um, possibility or information that there was prenatal alcohol exposure before we did the assessment. And we wanted in all cases, but in later years, we didn't have that information at the outset. We had to get it for the assessment and to make the diagnosis. But you can see that if you can get it before you actually do the assessment, the probability is very high that you will end up with an alcohol-related diagnosis, or ARND in our case. But if you are not quite as confident, you have to do some digging, and then you don't always get that information to the level of confidence that you need, then you're not going to be making the ARND diagnoses, but you may be making neurodevelopmental disorder, alcohol exposure unknown. These are still important use to assess and identify because they have significant problems. But they won't have, uh, they don't have FASD. So in the future, really, we should be doing more about assessing all of the youth in order to establish whether the, the tool is valid. We should also be assessing and screening a random control group, those not in trouble with law, how many of them would be screened in. And then we could make some comparisons. Then we could also look at some of those additional behaviors and um, we've been asked about alternate scoring procedures. Should some of the items be weighted more heavily than others? Or should we rate them on a scale rather than just yes and no, do they exist? So these are some of the things that we would like to do in our next research. And we're pleased that we're going to be able to be working with um, AB in the future to try to maybe tease some of these things out. So um, thank you very much for your participation. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Uh, we just have a couple questions while we're uh, getting the screen handed over to Ab to uh, finish up, and he's speaking on a similar topic to what uh, Julie just uh, presented on. Uh, the first question from Nicholas is, under the context of a clinical interview, what is the role of the diagnosticians in who or where to recommend the screening? Um, is that question particularly for the probation officer screening tool, or is that more for Kelly's tool? Well, it actually came in right as you were starting your presentation, but it may be related to Kelly's presentation as well. I think it's probably related to Kelly's because uh, ours is so specific to the group probation officers that, um, you know, it, it's a matter of that group being invited to make those referrals. So I think probably the question is more for Kelly. Do you want me to hold it till the end and, and let Julie finish answering questions that are relevant to her tool, or, or go ahead? Yeah, well, you might as well just answer it now since we've already uh, spent some time on it. Sure. Um, I think that, that the answer to that is it's probably not an answer you're hoping for, but it's clinician dependent. Um, I think during the course of the, cl the clinical interview, depending on what the referral question is, which is something we, we keep coming back to, um, those questions can, can come up um, through that. Um, or if the CBCL has been administered, um, that is another way to, to, uh, to glean um, answers to those questions. So it, it really is dependent on the style of the clinician. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, this one definitely is for you, Julie. Uh, this, this is one's from Marie, and she says, is the tool for probation officers used across Canada, and is it a standard tool to use, or is it an optional tool? Well, right now, it's only being used here in British Columbia in our lower mainland. But what we were hoping as a result of being involved in the development of the toolkit is that probation officers across the country could be using it. And there's been a lot of interest because when people download it from our website, uh, we ask them to register just so we know who is using it and so they can communicate back and forth with us. So I think people are interested now in using it, but you know, it still comes down to if I make that, if I do that screening, is there a place to send the individual for a diagnostic assessment? So I think that might be somewhat of a limiting factor, but I do believe that because the probation officers are getting the training in FASD, 
now this is available to them, and um, I think they will be using it. All right, thanks, Julie. Uh, the next question is from Nancy, and she asks, can this tool be applied for adults with any reliability? Uh, we're actually going to be start doing that here uh, in, at the Asante Center, and we have some adults, uh, both male and female, who are being released from institutions in our area, and we're going to be using the tool with that group to see how it can be used. We only made some minor adaptations to make it appropriate. The screening tool itself doesn't change but just some of the information that we're gathering around that screening tool. So, yes, we're hoping to use it. Um, and, uh, and then, again, in our center, uh, some of those individuals will be able to have access to an FASD assessment as a result. All right, thanks. And that's all the questions we have on, uh, at this uh, time. So we'll just, I'll just hand it back over to Elaine to give a quick introduction to Ab. We've already sort of wel welcomed you, Ab, and again, a huge thanks for being part of this afternoon. I just wanted to remind folks that the sort of um, remainder, sort of the final part of the formal presentation, and then there'll be lots, uh, there will be time for a few more questions as well. Ab is going to discuss the research emerging on how the probation officer tool can be potentially introduced and evaluated at the Manitoba FASD Youth Justice Program. Um, so over to you, Ab. Thank you, Elaine, and um, thanks, uh, Julie. It's always nice to hear and see that data again, and uh, it's it, uh, exciting that uh, there's going to be some extension to to uh, validate this tool. Uh, in Manitoba, we have um, a youth center, and there's an FASD pro diagnostic uh, program that. Uh, is basically a set, uh, extension of the Manitoba FASD Center, and uh, this uh, this program has been operational since uh, 2004. Uh, we thought that it would be sort of interesting to to trial the the tool in our center that was developed by uh, Julie and uh, Dr. Sande, and um, but we we needed to do some. Uh, trial work prior to implementation. And the pilot that we've uh, looked at is basically uh, going to be done in three phases. Uh, one is uh, retrospective, and one is basically just looking at the, the data um, to determine whether or not we actually could apply the tool on a retro retrospective basis. And then if that's the case, then go through a number of years um, retrospective review, looking at the the offenders that might be uh, positive for that. So I'm just um, moving down. Then the the FASD Youth Justice Pilot Project is a collaboration among Manitoba Justice Interagency FASD Program and the FASD Center, Manitoba Health, and the Youth Forensic Services. Uh, that's uh, primary through the Manitoba Adolescent Treatment Center. Uh, this began as a pilot, as I mentioned, in 2004, and uh, we're now fully funded by uh, Manitoba Justice. The goal of this program is to ensure that the youth affected with FASD and who are in conflict with the law will receive appropriate judicial dispositions, including a multidisciplinary assessment, diagnosis, and improved access to services. The project also assists in identifying and developing family-oriented and community-based resources. And the project currently serves with the Winnipeg area and recently has expanded to uh, the PAW in northern Manitoba. So uh, previously, in order for one of the youths to be assessed, uh, these were the criteria that we used. Uh, there had to be a history of prenatal alcohol that was confirmed. There had to be evidence of repeated fail to comply, uh, lacking of empathy, poor school performance, difficulties within the institutions, the difficulties the offender may have with the peer, or difficulties with the staff and compliance issues, uh, opportunistic crime, uh, like they're not really well planned out, and, um, and they get caught. Uh, crime risky with little gain, and uh, superficial relationships. 
So these are just some of the red flags that were used, but the program did not start with a well-defined checklist. And, uh, uh, and I thank Julie and her colleagues for bringing forward uh, a more rigorous approach so that you know, these, these issues can be more properly evaluated. These are some of our statistics. Um, since 2004, there have been 474 youth that were referred to for uh, to diagnostic services. We've only assessed 130. Some of these youth were discharged prior to uh, being seen, or some of them didn't meet uh, the criteria after evaluated by our coordinators. Um, 92 have received a diagnosis with uh, FASD. That represents a 71% detection rate using our red flag approach to identifying at-risk individuals. And uh, as Julie showed, our figures show too that uh, very few of them have classical FAS. And in fact, it was only a month ago that we were able to diagnose the first uh, youth who had full FAS. Most of them are partial FAS, with the majority being ARMD. So uh, in terms of the screen tool, our objectives in this research were to review the charts at the Manitoba Youth Center to assess applicability of the Asante tool to our center. And the one, one of the uh, objectives was, is the information in the youth uh, charts adequate to answer the screen questions? How many youth were screened positive using the Asante tool? And what proportion? who are screen positive or screen negative on the Asante tool were referred to the FASD Justice Diagnostic Clinic. So you can see we could answer a lot of uh, those questions just by reviewing those charts. So of the youth seen in the diagnostic clinic, what proportion were screen positive for the Asante? Uh, we initially wanted to do a retrospective review of uh, up to 400 charts in a one four-year period of time out of the possible 1,500 admissions annually. Now, you might gasp at that figure, and I certainly did too. Some of these are readmissions. Some of them are children brought to the youth center by the police and then discharged that day. And so it's probably overinflating what the real number of that come in and actually stay in the center. Um, the inclusion criteria will be that the youth is admitted to the youth center in that time period. The youth must have a probation officer because the data that uh, the questions that are asked on the tool are done by probation officers. So they're, usually these individuals have been in the system for some time. Data will be collected and analyzed by our graduate student. And uh, our study was approved by the Youth Justice Court and the Health Ethics Committee at the University of Manitoba. So our research collaborators uh, are Deepa Singhal, who's our uh, graduate student, who's doing uh, her PhD in an FASD-related er area. Um, Dr. Sally Longstaff, uh, who is uh, the director of the Manitoba uh, FASD Center, and a colleague of mine, and she and I are the two clinicians, along with um, our psychologist, uh, Dr. Fisher, who uh, sees most of those uh, children. Uh, Dan Nault and Teresa Brown, who are the two uh, coordinators at the Mount of Youth Center, and uh, they do all the work. We get all the credit. Uh, Judge Mary Kate Harvey, who uh, is really was instrumental in bringing forward the issues of FASD at youth and is uh, chair of the uh, Youth Justice FASD Committee. And of course, I'd thank uh, Julie Connery and Chris Locke, uh, who are colleagues in the FASD field. And uh, again, thanks to uh, Elaine and members of the Cassie Steering Committee uh, for um, FASD uh, Screening Tool Committee uh, um, can, um, that um, are participating in these webinars. So I, I don't have any data to show you, but um, I wanted to let you know that this, if this retrospective study proves uh, fruitful, we then hope to go into uh, a, a phase three uh, prospective uh, applying this tool and then comparing the, uh, the yield of diagnosis and looking at specificity and sensitivity of this tool uh, 
relevant to uh, our past experience using the, um, the other uh, rather non-rigorous tool. So that's all I have to say, and I'd be happy to um, answer questions that uh, others may have. Thanks, Ab. Um, while we're waiting for uh, any questions to come in, do any of the, if any of the other panel members uh, have any comments, please feel free to jump in. We, we don't have any questions yet, but uh, that was a fairly short presentation, so we, we may get a few questions within a couple seconds here. But if any of the panelists have any comment there, please, please feel free to jump in. Well, I guess I would just add um, that it's been really satisfying to see how the Screening Tool project has evolved over the last couple of years since its uh, inception, which was simply, you know, to try to find some screening tools. But for each of the screening tools, so much more work has been done with them since that time. And it's really it's gratifying to see that. And it really shows how our field is moving ahead. And screening has been such an important issue that people have been concerned about. Mm -hmm. if, I can, if I can just add to that, Julie, it's Elaine. I, I really share your your enthusiasm about the evolution of this work and and it represents so many people from across the country but I think what's really important to emphasize today is the opportunity with a greater number of people for us to continue the development work from the questions that have been posed today I have certainly taken note of a number of opportunities around development and 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 moving this uh, this agenda forward, so I I, I think um, you know you're you're recognizing that Julie, being one of our researchers who attended the first workshop back in 2007, for example, uh, is really really an important point. And I and I would encourage um, our our uh, colleagues who are online with us this afternoon to uh, to provide your thoughts and comments on what's needed in continuing to develop the, uh, the living toolkit as, uh, as we've referenced a few times today. And I think one really important theme that I'm, that I'm hearing that's, that's come up since 2007 and then even today that I think is really important is this idea of screening and, and then what? What are, what are our next steps? And, uh, you know, we have the one diagnostic center, let's say, per province in, in some provinces, but I think what we're doing by um, sharing the not exchanging knowledge in this way is raising awareness and to be able to go and say look that we've screened X number of children positive we need more um, resources and more diagnostic clinics and able you know in order to address this very significant need for this population mm -hmm. and I think I think Kelly along the advocacy point really that you're raising as well I think I can, the advantage that, um, that our speakers and Doug and I have is we have the advantage of seeing all of the participants on today's call and others. And this too has been a collaborative effort. So on call today we have our colleagues from the Public Health Agency of Canada and who are true advocates and uh, supporters of the work that's being done not just on the screening toolkit but in many other areas related to FASD and I think that that's probably a responsibility that every one of us can take on in terms of really advocating for the need we have to increase the capacity from a diagnostic perspective so that as our screening uh, tool resources our abilities to screen increases um, as, as our content experts have pointed out today, we must have the diagnostic capacity. Otherwise, there really is a gap in, uh, in, in the work that we're doing. Well, there has been a question come in. We are pretty much at the, at the scheduled end of our webinar at, at 2.30. We do, we do have one more question here for, for uh, Ab and Julie. Uh, this one says, is from Sheila, and she says, both pilots link with uh, existing diagnostic clinics. What challenges or opportunities do you see for jurisdictions that are developing non-clinic diagnostic settings? Um, I guess I'm not sure what that would include, non-clinic diagnostic settings. I don't, I'm not sure what that would be. Do you know, do you have an idea of what they're referring well, no, to? Well, no, I don't understand that terminology either. Um, okay. <laughs> can, I don't know whether the the person who's posed the question is still there to clarify it? 
Yeah, if, uh, Sheila, if you could maybe uh, just provide a follow-up and a little bit of clarification on what you mean exactly by non-clinical diagnostic settings, and maybe specifically who, if this was something related to uh, Kelly's information from earlier on in the presentation. Yeah. Uh, she's 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 followed up with developing virtual teams that are not under one roof. Well, I mean, I, I think the truth is many of our teams are virtual. Um, I think. Uh, we get together usually when uh, all the other assessments have been done, and some of the other assessments for diagnosis are done on different days. So, you know, you 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 bring in the professionals when they are available, and the patient when they are available. And um, but in terms of our system, uh, they're seen independently by psychologists. They're seen independently by our OT. They're seen independently by our um, speech and language pathologist, they're interviewed by the social worker well in advance, and then they uh, come and see the uh, the clinicians uh, who do the, the physical examinations and bring things together with other team members for uh, a diagnosis and then a debriefing and, uh, and recommendations. So, so in part there is, we're doing a virtual team most of the time, um, but uh, and when we use telehealth, of course, <laughs> you know, we're not in the same building. Um, so I, I, I think that the reality is you have to use the resources that are available and use them in, you know, how, however one can within the centers that, that they exist. So, uh, but it has to be coordinated and the, the individuals involved in the multidisciplinary team need to be able to, to communicate with each other and contribute to arriving at a final diagnosis and recommendations. All right, thanks, Ab. I think that's all the uh, questions that we have. And I've put up on the screen just uh, the, cat, the, the contact information for the folks at CAPC. And we are more than happy to get you in touch with any of our uh, presenters or direct you to the information that we have on our Knowledge Exchange Network. And that link is also up on the screen right now. Or uh, put you in touch with any of our uh, experts that, that help us out on our that, participate in our, our National Steering Committee on our FASD work. Um, I'm just going to hand it over to uh, Elaine uh, Orbein for just to say some uh, final comments. And uh, just one more reminder that this uh, entire uh, recording, the audiovisual recording, will be on the Knowledge Exchange Network within uh, a few days to a week. Uh, sometime early next week it should be up on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, so over to you, Elaine. Thanks, Doug. And, uh... I want to I want to begin by by um, thanking all of our participants. We've had uh, tremendous representation from across the country once again today. Doug, I'd like to thank you for your tremendous uh, facilitation and technical expertise, uh, and and having this webinar run uh, this and all of our webinar webinars run so smoothly. Uh, to to Kelly uh, Kelly Nash and Ab Chutley and Julie Conry, thank you for an outstanding collective presentation. You have added a tremendous amount of knowledge, new knowledge, information, as well as validation of how important our work, our collective work in this area is. And, uh, and on behalf of, of CAFC and our national FASD screening uh, tool committee, I really want to uh, thank the three of you for your contribution today. I'd like to remind everyone that we are looking forward now to our fifth webinar in our series, and that will take place on June the 30th. Uh, and the time, again, is 1 to 2.30 Eastern Time. We are very honored at that point to be welcoming Dr. Lori Vitale-Cox. Uh, Lori is the Educational Psychology Coordinator at the Education Division of the Eastern Door. FASD diagnostic team in New Brunswick. Lori um, has been actively involved with CAFC in the development of our screening toolkit as well. Um, on, and then the final webinar in our series is going to be, um, as all of them are, a very special sort of finale to this year, uh, to this year's series, and then that's going to take place um, in, in actually in the early fall on September the 12th and that's going to be focused on the ethics of meconium screening and that will be led by uh, Stuart McLeod, Dr. Stuart McLeod um, from uh, UBC and uh, Stuart will be joined by I'm going to say a very exciting 
uh, panel of multidisciplinary uh, professionals. So and on that note, I again will thank everyone for your tremendous participation uh, this afternoon and we look forward to welcoming you back to our fifth webinar on June the 30th. Thank you everybody.